Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for listening to the speakers that we've had this morning as we've had wonderful presentations. But what I wanted to emphasize is, obviously we've learned this is not just a problem from the past. It's a current problem. People are still being exposed to asbestos. People are still developing asbestos-related diseases. Physicians are treating them for these diseases. Surgeons are having surgery to help them get longevity and prolong life. So as this problem is still current, we also know because of legacy asbestos, the problem is going to continue in the future. Our goal is to keep the awareness out there, to stop exposures, and to help people get monitored so that they can get early detection, as we learned earlier this morning, so that they can get great treatment. As we go forward, you're going to hear more today about what legacy asbestos means and what the future is. Thank you again. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard Lemon. I'm moderator of this session on prevention. And we have a very distinguished panel today that I'd like to get with very shortly and introduce to you. But first, I'd like to make a couple of comments about the international firefighters. Um, and this is very important to us because the firefighters have been a very strong supporter of ADAO since we began. Uh, the firefighters were represented at our very first meeting at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. in 2005, which I was at also. We are very extremely happy to have the firefighters backing the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. They've been a steady proponent of the prevention of asbestos-related disease. It's very important to them because it affects their own health. Studies at NIOSH have been done to show that firefighters are at a much higher risk of asbestos-related diseases than other occupations. And we've received a letter for the beginning of this conference that uh, has been of very much support to us, and I'll just read a little bit of it. It says, Dear Linda, that's Linda Reinstein, who interrupted me a minute ago, <laughs> so we will uh, continue. Uh, he says, Dear Linda, on behalf of the 30, 331,000 members of the International Association of Firefighters, I write to share, you, share our congratulations to you and the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization on the occasion of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization's 17th Annual Asbestos Awareness and Prevention Conference. Since the early days of ADAO, the International As uh, Association of Firefighters has proudly stood in partnership with you as we advanced our, of our mutual quest to draw attention to the harmful health impacts resulting from asbestos exposures and to advance legislation to eliminate preventable asbestos exposure and related diseases. We want to thank the international firefighters. That was from the international firefighters general president, Edward A. Kelly. We thank you very much, Mr. Kelly, and all of the 331,000 members of the Firefighters Union for br bringing their support to the ADAO and together we hope that we can make a difference and get asbestos banned in the United States. But let us talk a little bit now in our panel presentation about what it is that is really affecting firefighters and many, many others today, and that is legacy asbestos. Simple question. What is it, and what are we going to do about it? And today we have a fine panel that is going to talk about that with us. Our first speaker, and I'm not going to go into much detail about the speakers because I think it will come out during their presentations, I will introduce is from Canada, and that is Toby McDonald. And Toby, we welcome you here. We know you have had a long uh, trail dealing with 
the prevention of asbestos-related disease, and it's a very personal one to you, I think, uh, starting with your daughter in school, and we appreciate you taking the time to share your story with us. So with that, Toby, thank you. Hello, my name is Toby McDonald. I graduated as a registered nurse in 1992. I'm a fierce, protective, supportive mother of two, now an asbestos advocate since 2018. The asbestos breaches that were a real wake-up call to many of us here in Summerside, Prince Edward Island, which is on the east coast of Canada. In 2018, when I was made aware that there were a number of breaches that occurred with asbestos as well as lead at my daughter's high school, the situation was downplayed and dismissed as an inadvertent situation as officials said they were not aware that the area contained asbestos due to a mislabeled diagram. As a parent, I took for granted the thought that my children would never be put in harm's way at their school. You can remove the slide. Finding out students were exposed to asbestos in 2017 was overwhelming. Then finding out the information was withheld from parents by government officials was shocking. Staff were given the benefit of finding out in a timely manner Parents were not given that same courtesy. Communication with parents was severely lacking. I believe this was a betrayal of trust. Breaches were leaked via social media. We had high level of assurances by public officials who basically said, trust us, all while dismissing concerns of students and parents. As a parent who was finding out that there's no safe level of asbestos exposure, this raised many concerns. I started by emailing all the sitting government officials in our province and encouraged others to do the same. Students even started a petition to stop renovations due to their concerns. We received little information from government. We asked for all the testing that was done. We received one. This was the beginning of learning how to file freedom of information requests. As a result, some things that we learned. We I found an email that was dated a year prior to the breach to let us know that the government officials were aware there was asbestos in that area. Uh, the asbestos breaches were much more extensive than what we were told. One of the breached areas didn't even have asbestos testing done. In another breach area, cleaning occurred prior to testing. Even after cleaning, asbestos dust samples were in the millions. Controls appeared not to have been immediately put in place. Here is a quote from one of the meetings on March 10. I won't name the company. Discovered this on Wednesday, but as of this morning, there still were no controls put in place for our protection. We asked for this to be rectified, and we were assured it would happen. Cleaning occurred as well prior to testing after two other dust events yes, occurred. Dust events that caused students to have to leave the building. Four meetings, I had permission that I had to get permission to attend to, to be able to ask questions were nothing short of disturbing. Many of the questions were left unanswered. Some information were not offered. Parents were blamed for the 3 0 senior high school renovations being in the media. After these meetings abruptly ended, the only information we were able to get was through the Freedom of Information. Some we still have not received as of yet, and others were heavily redacted. A report from an occupational health and safety investigation in March 2017 is one of the main reasons why I continue and I pushed for a registry. And it quote, as I it quotes, approved ACM protocols were not implemented. And workers of this employer as well as school custodial workers and other people in the building were exposed to asbestos fibers. ACM was transferred from the English language school board demolition site into the, the adjacent sections of the building. As my advocating stubbornness, I was invited to attend an asbestos conference in Toronto. Um, I took the chance and I learned lots. While in Toronto, I met a reporter and she actually did a doc projects as well as an article on Three Oaks Senior High School and both were released in November, 2019. 
students and parents held protests. We would go and sit in our legislature gallery and show displeasure with the lack of information being communicated and released. More needs to be done for the students that were present. I was invited to sit in legislature gallery on November 14th, 2019 as a motion that prohibits construction that could result in the uh, release of dangerous particulates in school with children present was passed. This was brought forward by Trish Altis, my MLA, and Carla Bernard of the official opposition of Prince of Rhode Island. This motion was inspired by the breaches of Three Oaks Senior High School in hopes that it would never happen again. Since early on, I have been petitioning the government to implement a Three Oaks Senior High School registry that would allow for medical monitoring and the registry was implemented this year in 2022, maintaining student information for 50 years. Unfortunately, our government has fallen short and the registry doesn't contain any education or medical monitoring aspects as we requested. This is concerning. We believe as concerned parents, we had the right to request a timely rigorous review of the Three Oaks Senior High School renovations. What we received was an underwhelming, incomplete review that we had to beg to be made public. It raised more questions than answer. And the fact that the second review that they did continues to be withheld from students and parents, and it's approximately two years now, raises even more red flags. The fact that this and other information continues to be withheld, even though we were told we would have full access continues to be disturbing. We thought lessons would have been learned, yet in 2020, the public school board has been ordered to pay $50,000 after pleading guilty to two health and safety infractions involving asbestos at another school. That they describe as being a misstep. To date, no fines or penalties have been issued for the Three Oaks Senior High School breaches. And as many of you know, dealing with the government can be difficult. When the government dismissed parents, we rallied and we formed a parent and student group and it helped, gave each other support. The government said I was being difficult by asking too many questions. So I continued to expose the truth. When the government continued to hold, withhold information, I will continue to look for accountability. When they shut down communications, I reached out to asbestos experts and warriors from around the world. When they intimidated me, I took a deep breath in and I believed in what I was doing. Moving forward is difficult. It's scary. There's many unknowns, there's no guarantees, but lessons can be learned. And I have a new purpose now as being an asbestos warrior. My purpose is to continue to collect information, build a solid foundation of data for the Three Oaks Senior High School students to use in the future, if need be. I'm continuously trying to improve awareness and education about the dangers of asbestos exposure, especially in schools. There's much more work to be done in our products. Lessons can be learned to make productive educational changes that will protect everyone. Prevention, prevention is key. Concerning the Three Oaks Senior High School registry, I will continue, continue to push for improvements. All students and staff deserve to have peace of mind and coverage. Canada banned asbestos in December, 2018 with the help of people from around the world, especially people like ADAL. So now it's our turn to return the, the favor and support their fight to ban asbestos with the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act of 2022. I would like to extend my appreciation to Linda, ADAO, and all the sponsors of the invitation to share and work in session three about preventing asbestos. Thank you. Thank you so much, Toby. You're welcome. We certainly appreciate your insight and the work that you're doing, and we appreciate you being here today to present to us. Next, we're moving to Dr. Rajai Flores, who is with the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Raja, are you on the screen? 
All right, so my talk today is on to toxic public housing. Um, you can't really talk about asbestos in a vacuum. There's a lot of other things that come into play in housing, specifically public housing, when it comes to health, and that includes asbestos. So I want to put this in context of what we've been dealing with uh, for the past several years with COVID. The next slide is a CAT scan of a patient who has COVID. On the left side of the screen, you have a scan that shows white patches in the lung. And on the other side, uh, there is a regular CAT scan with just lung. And white in this context is very bad. That's how the patients die. And unfortunately at Mount Sinai, we were hit by uh, a, a wave of patients. It was probably one of the scariest times in the history of the hospital. Uh, we had tents in Central Park. We had patients overflowing in the, uh, uh, in the hallway. Uh, and it was a difficult time. But while we were going through this, we also did some research. And the research that we did was uh, uh, recently published. And the next slide shows that uh, the disparities in COVID-19 testing and positivity in New York City. Um, so that's the title of this research paper that was published. And what we found was that in the 23,000 deaths that we saw during the period of this study, 34% um, were Hispanic, 28% were Black, 27% were White, 7% were Asian. And this was a very um, disproportionate number of people. Next slide, please. Uh, this was a very disproportionate number of people that were affected. When you look at it, um, you know, Hispanics make up uh, maybe 26%, yet 34% were expect, uh, uh, affected. So it was very disproportionate. And is it because of the melanin in their skin? Is it because of other factors? Of course, it's because of the social and economic, economic determinants of health. So when you look at our neighborhood results, you'll find that the rich zip codes uh, showed that uh, there were more testing done. And in the poor zip codes, there was less testing done. And I think many people will argue, well, is it because did those patient populations do worse because they had less access to medical care? And I will say, no, they had access to medical care. They could go to the local hospitals, et cetera. But what was it that determined why such a high number of patients were dying disproportionately? And the next slide shows the two sides of Mount Sinai. Um, Mount Sinai is located uh, on 98th Street and Madison Avenue. It's in between the richest of the rich in the Upper East Side and the poorest of the poor in Spanish Harlem. The next so slide shows 98th Street, which shows the St. Bernard School for Boys where the tuition is $44,000. And, uh, and then you contrast that with what's on the other side of Mount Sinai on Madison Avenue. The next slide shows the Carver housing projects. And why is that important? It's important because everybody that kept coming to work at Mount Sinai, the people that cook the food, the orderlies, uh, the transporters, uh, the people that were really the essential workers that kept the place going, they lived in public housing. Spanish Harlem is the second largest public housing area in the United States. And Mount Sinai is the largest um, employer of patients who live in Spanish Harlem. And you know, when you look at the Carver houses, uh, I would look out the window and I see the people coming right out of the Carver houses and walking right into Mount Sinai. And who lives there? who lives in, in, in these buildings. And uh, what you'll find is it's the secretaries, the janitors, the nurses, cops, veterans, students, home attendants. These are the people that kept coming when COVID hit us. These are the people uh, who showed up. Now at work, there were many people who just checked out. They didn't come back. Many retired, many didn't show up. And we didn't know what we were dealing with. Now we have a handle on COVID, but back then we didn't know what we were dealing with, and a lot of people just checked out. But these are the people that kept on coming. And what are they exposed to? 
The next slide shows somebody's apartment where you have lead peeling from their walls. Who knows if there's asbestos behind there? You have children, they're exposed to lead. Uh, they have difficulty learning, asbestos exposure for many years. Uh, the next slide shows appliances that aren't working. Uh, the next slide shows frequent flooding. And while you can't see asbestos in these areas, at least not obviously, uh, you can see mold. And you have mold here, black mold on the ceilings of, of someone's uh, apartment. And if they are not taking care of the mold, what makes you think they're doing anything with asbestos? Now, I've done a lot of research when it comes to New York public housing, NYCHA, and I've tried to find where is the asbestos located. There's no records of it. This is something I am convinced that has been done on purpose because it's so expensive to abate this legacy asbestos. And I, I feel as if this is all brushed under the rug because it is way too expensive. But let's take something simple, for example, the mold. What happens when you're exposed to mold? You get this fungus ball, and then that can cause bleeding and make you sick. And then you have, uh, you have to make this big incision in the person's chest. The next slide shows us taking out a rib. The next slide shows the lung with the fungus ball in it. And then sometimes you can even have and empyema, which is where you get an infection outside of this chest space. And this is a patient with a hole in their chest. Uh, this is very, very sad, but the problem with this is that this is very, very preventable. When you see a patient like this and you realize that they are like this because they've been exposed to toxic mold, because they have asbestos in their house, because they're exposed to many other toxic conditions in their living environment, and they are paying rent every day, and they are showing up to the hospital in the middle of COVID to fight for other New Yorkers, for other Americans that, that are suffering from COVID, it, it just breaks your heart. And it makes you realize that the solution to this is not medical, it's not surgical, there's a political solution. I've tried to figure out the data out there on this so that I could do research on it. But what I found is there's no research that needs to be done on it. The data is out there. Uh, this first study uh, was done by tenants in Far Rockaway. And what they found uh, is that they surveyed 700 tenants. And the bottom line, they found that people that lived in public housing died at a rate of six times greater than those that lived not in public housing in the Rockaways. And that is, um, you know, from many different things, from mold, from asbestos exposure, many lung cancers, many uh, uh, mesothelioma cases, uh, but the cause is frequently swept under the rug. This study was done by Vernell Robinson, who I worked closely with when uh, I, I, I'm a member of this organization called Community Voices Heard that's based mm -hmm. in Spanish Harlem. And, uh, and she's the one that basically did this entire study. But then NYCHA did a study as well, the New York City uh, Housing Authority, and they found that to fix this problem of mold, which would be about $10 billion of lead abatement, et cetera, all this would cost about $20 billion. And what they didn't even include in there is the legacy asbestos. That is just an extra layer that will hurt patients down the line. And many times you'll see walls crumbling in public housing and you will see, I've actually taken, gone there myself. I've gone to people's apartments and have taken samples to look at it. But it is something that, is very hidden, it's expensive. People wanna turn and wanna look the other way because you don't see the results until many years later. Now, this next slide shows uh, the ceiling that is uh, uh, crumbling uh, and you think, well, why not just, you know, uh, break that down, uh, put some plaster on there and fix it. The problem is that ceilings like this, you're just looking at the tip of the iceberg. It's really what's on the rooftops 
where you have uh, poor maintenance and garbage accumulation that allows this to take place. And then this water goes all through the walls of uh, the housing complex and it causes this mold and it causes these toxic conditions. And when it comes to asbestos, there's a hotline. And when you go to that hotline, you'll find that you get prompted to many other different areas. It's not a quick, easy, oh, I have asbestos, fix it. There's always a lot of red tape associated with it. And asbestos in public housing in New York City is always in the news. This is a title that shows asbestos found in a burst pipe in a NYCHA complex. The next title, Queensbridge houses residents fed up over mold, asbestos, lead, flooding, cockroaches, and other vermin. Sue NYCHA over years of neglect. And then you have testimonials of patients. Uh, I have asbestos in my apartment. Uh, can I sue if I moved out? Uh, another one, I lived in NYCHA for 25 years. Several times I told housing that I had mold and asbestos. They deny that I did. Two weeks after moving out, they said I had asbestos. So many of the tenants are made to feel silly about reporting asbestos. Many of the tenants do not report anything because they're afraid they're gonna get kicked out of their apartment if they make too much noise. Now, I wanted to do a study looking at this. So I did my homework and what I found is in 2018, there was already a big study done by the governor's office. Cuomo was there and uh, the head of uh, the Department of Health at this time, I forget his name, uh, but he was involved in this study. And the bottom line is that they found that 83%, four out of five apartments in New York City public housing had a severe health hazard, which included mold, asbestos, lead paint, uh, rats, roaches, uh, secondhand smoke, water damage. And it is extremely sad because these, this is preventable. These are the people that showed up during COVID, they pay rent. And what did they find? They found that with many of these exposures, you have asthma, you have diabetes, uh, obesity, hypertension, heart disease, cancer. Uh, and they want to blame the victim. All oh, these people don't take care of themselves. These are dirty people. And they come up with a false narrative to not take care of them. But these are the people that paid rent. These are the people that showed up with COVID. And let me give you an example of one of the full. And the other thing, when you look at all these diseases, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, they're all diseases that predispose you to dying from COVID. So it is no surprise that public housing residents had a higher proportion of deaths from COVID. But let me give you an example of one of the false narratives, uh, and that has to do with welfare. Uh, you'll hear many people say, oh, well, they're all on welfare. When you look at New York City public housing, 87% are either actively working, collecting Social Security, veterans benefits, et cetera, 13% of public housing residents in New York City are on welfare. And the, in the United States, that number is 20%. So there's a false narrative going out there about what's happening with these patients. They are sick. We see them in our clinics. And like I said, there's not a medical solution. There is not a surgical solution. There is a political solution. And it really upsets me when I know that ADAO is in its 17th year to try and ban asbestos in the United States, it shows how there are so many forces that are working against ADAO. And when you look at the study that New York State did, and this shows you the political uh, mindset that blows me away, how much money do you think the government gave to NYCHA from the state the year after this study was done, which is in 2019? How much money do you think the government gave? the big donut. So they did the study, they know what's happening, and there is zero money given to the patients who have uh, exposure, zero. So I wanna end with this quote, that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And in my mind, that's ADAO and Linda at the helm. 
Uh, you know, Linda is relentless. She will not give up. 17 years for a simple thing, ban asbestos in the United States. It's not that hard. It, it, it uh, accentuates the problems that are in our political system uh, where you have simple solutions to problems that still can't get passed. Uh, so thank you for having me. And I'm going to keep fighting alongside Linda until we get this thing done. Thanks so thank much. Thank you so much, Dr. Flores. We appreciate your comments. They were quite insightful. Now we'll move to our next speaker, who is Brent Kynock. Brent. Good afternoon, all. My name is Brent Kynock. I'm the managing director of the Environmental Information Association. And our organization is a group of professionals who are involved in the identification and remediation of environmental hazards from buildings and uh, facilities and homes throughout the United States. Uh, I, I do, before I begin, I just want to say uh, thank you to Dr. Flores for his excellent presentation. To have uh, a surgeon talking about prevention is a beautiful thing. I had the great pleasure of speaking with Dr. Wolf last night about the work that she does. And for those of us that are involved in trying to identify and remediate asbestos, it's a great reminder when we talk to a surgeon about the real consequences that you see every day in your work. So thank you for your involvement with ADAO. Thank you for uh, being a part of prevention because I think we all know what that's about. I'm here to talk a little bit more about legacy asbestos and what it is. So uh, let me share with you first, uh, the title of my presentation is that uh, uh, the top 10 things you should know about legacy asbestos. Number one, what you should know, legacy asbestos is everywhere. And I have a lot of pictures there, some examples. You see pipe insulation, you see floor tile, you see sprayed on fireproofing, you see zonalite insulation, and you see drywall joint compound. Yes, indeed, we have a problem in our nation's buildings, and it's called legacy asbestos. Number two thing you should know about legacy asbestos is it can result in exposure. Of course it can. If it's everywhere and we're walking by it, on it, under it, over it every day, there's going to be exposure. And I have a picture of a firefighter there. We talked a little earlier about the International Association of Firefighters. And imagine the firefighter who needs to rush into a building to put out a fire and save persons trapped in that building. They don't think about what they might be exposed to as they enter that building. Uh, and yes, uh, legacy asbestos results in exposure. Number three thing you should know about legacy asbestos, more than 40,000 Americans, not around the world, 40,000 Americans die every year from exposure to legacy asbestos. This is a very real problem. Number four on our list of top 10, there is no requirement to label legacy asbestos. Now, some of you may be surprised by that. In our nation's schools, we have a regulation called AHERA, the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act, and it does require labeling of asbestos. But once we get outside of schools that are kindergarten through 12, there is no requirement. So let's go back to the exposure potential. You have persons working in and around legacy asbestos that currently exists in our nation's buildings today. And they, in some cases, have no idea that they are working beside, around, cutting through, ripping out asbestos containing material. And that is a problem. Number five, maybe this won't surprise you. EPA has no idea how much asbestos exists in our country. Now, EPA, back in the mid-1980s, came out with a study, and they said there were some 735,000 buildings with friable asbestos throughout our country. But I remind you of that adjective there, friable. They didn't talk about materials that are non-friable that may eventually become friable. So EPA really has no idea how large our problem is, and I think we can all uh, agree and understand that the legacy asbestos problem is indeed large. Also, EPA has no idea how much is being added to our national problem. Because we haven't banned asbestos in this country, 
we continue to add to our legacy asbestos problem. And since there is no requirement for labeling, there's no requirement for uh, importers to say that they have asbestos in a certain material. And since there are a number of materials where asbestos is still legal, we have no idea what's being added to our already severely burdensome problem in this country. Number seven thing you need to know about legacy asbestos. Well, of course, if legacy asbestos will continue until we ban asbestos in this country. Until we ban it, uh, the problem just continues to grow every year. But even with the ban, our number eight thing to know about legacy asbestos, we will be dealing with this asbestos for decades. I would never be one that says that we should have a wholesale requirement for abatement and remediation of asbestos. Uh, I have a slide later that talks a little about that, but we will be dealing with this for decades. So I think we should probably do something about making sure the problem doesn't continue to grow. Number nine thing you should know about legacy asbestos, leave it alone. Uh, I've spoken at other ADAO conferences and talked about what a homeowner should do about asbestos, and my words are simple, leave it alone. Let a professional deal with it if it has to be dealt with, but because most asbestos is non-friable and is not releasing fibers into the atmosphere, let's leave it alone and then let, let a professional deal with identification and remediation when that time comes. And last, the number 10 thing I want you to know about legacy asbestos is the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act of 2022 addresses many of these. How and why? Because it places a very solid ban on all forms of asbestos in this country. We have two things going on right now in our country. We have a regulatory ban that's possible through EPA, but is moving, in my opinion, entirely too slowly. We also have the opportunity for a legislative ban, and that's what our ban provides us with. And it would indeed work to make sure the legacy problem of asbestos does not continue to grow, and then would lead us down a path of making sure persons potentially exposed to legacy are provided the greatest protection possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brent. That was very uh, good and very concise and very to the point and leaves us all with 10 important things to think about. Very good. Thank you. Our next speaker is industrial hygienist Tom Lobenthal. Good afternoon, folks. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I want to thank Linda and Emily and the ADAO sponsors for uh, putting this all together. Uh, I have the opportunity to speak to you folks before. Uh, I've been in the industry, asbestos control industry since 1984. I have been an advocate as well as a regulatory expert. But I also follow a lead paint issue, and I want to thank Dr. Raja for, uh, Flores for bringing up what's going on with the uh, Housing Authority in New York. I've been following that very closely, and it is a mess. I wish we had more time to talk about that, but I think he covered it pretty well. Uh, what I want to cover today is asbestos in the home, specifically for homeowners. Uh, I'm not going to be dealing with uh, housing authority type stuff. I think Dr. Flores has covered that pretty well. And when we get to further things, I'll talk about people with rentals a bit. All right, so legacy asbestos, I think Brett covered this pretty well, but those materials that are present in million of homes. So that's what my focus will be to drill down on, but also in incalculable quantities in commercial and industrial structures. Getting the EPA to ban all asbestos use in the, in the U.S. is a very important step. The Allen Reinstein Act is, is near and dear to our heart, and we fight to keep that alive and keep it moving. But we cannot ignore the quantity of asbestos-containing materials in the United States and not determine that's a very important part. One of the things we need to do is not only determine whether we have asbestos in these buildings, but does it actually provide a risk? So what I want to talk about specifically for homeowners is what we call real versus perceived risks. And we'll talk about that as we go along. So what I want to do is uh, drill down a little bit. Uh, Brent showed you some general things here of things we find in homes, especially older homes. Again, uh, uh, modern building construction often doesn't have asbestos, but it's not 100%. We never know what we might find there because we do not have a ban. Okay, Almost all ACM or asbestos-containing materials in modern construction will be low risk in homes if in good shape and left undisturbed. All right, so one of the most common materials that we find in, in homes 
um, are these textured ceilings. And there are many, many different versions of these things. Uh, these things are friable materials, but many of them have been in buildings for years. And as long as they're in good shape, they're not delaminating, they're not falling apart, they're not water damaged, uh, they provide low risk. Uh, but the fact is we need to make sure that we leave this alone. But what I want you to notice is the picture that's in the bottom left where we have the laminating material. This can happen from age, it can happen from vibration, it can happen from water damage. These are the kinds of materials that we need to pay attention to because asbestos can be released when these sorts of things occur. We need to get professional help. So as an example of real versus perceived risk, at the top, people get uh, afraid because they have these materials in homes, but I do not believe there would be significant asbestos fibers merely because of its presence. But once we have the materials that are damaged like this or they wouldn't be disturbed, then we can have significant risk. Another material that's very common is the flooring that we find in homes. Uh, and the pictures that you see in uh, the two left pictures, nine by nine inch floor tiles and uh, one in gray, they're 12 by 12 inch floor tiles. Uh, they are very, very common in buildings. And what happens is, is that these materials can fall apart and be a problem. Actually, what we find in research is if you have these, keep them waxed. A good old school floor wax keeps them from, from being scuffed up and maybe releasing asbestos. And as long as they're in good shape, they're fine. Uh, but it has everything to do with their condition. Okay. Um, the other material that we see on the right is the what we call linoleum or the sheet flooring. Some of that stuff can have very high percentage, 75% asbestos, chrysotile asbestos in the backing. Uh, again, when you leave it alone, it's fine, but you can see the damage in the picture here. That is actually exposing chrysotile bearing material. And if that was being walked on, excuse me, over and over again in the home, that would be a problem. Actually, I had to speak to someone last night that's a colleague uh, where an abatement contractor went into the basement of somebody's home, and not, actually not an abatement contractor, just a flooring contractor, and ripped one of these up and made a heck of a mess. And there's contamination now all over the basement, and luckily it didn't get through the house because the air conditioning system was not running. But they're going to have to do a massive abatement and clean up because this was done poorly. So again, we have to be careful with these materials if they're in good shape. We can leave them be, but if they're damaged or we need to get rid of them, we want professional help. Another one that you see on the left is super common in just about every kind of building, what we call joint wallboard joint compound. And a lot of people don't have a construction background that might not recognize this because most of our walls are painted. But when we hang up this gypsum drywall, what they'll do is use a sealer to make the seams smooth to the wallboard itself. And you notice little dots, that's where they're covering up the screws or the nail heads. These materials can have asbestos, but in most homes, it's been painted over many times. So as long as that's covered and in good shape and not exposed and damaged, we're in good shape. But we really don't know. This is one of those problematic materials that has gotten into modern construction, although it is super common in the older construction. When we get into the damaging of these walls, we read and know what's there. And if they have to be, if they have to be damaged during renovation or partial uh, demolition of a home, we need to make sure we know what we have. Then the other picture on the right would be things like window glazing compound, caulk, sealants, mastics, which are glues. Many of those things have asbestos in them, but as long as they're in good shape, we're not disturbing them, they're not going to cause significant risk in a home. Then uh, asbestos cement shingles that are very, very common on homes. Uh, we use the term transite for this. It's an old Johns Manville term that's become common. Uh, very, very common, uh, various kinds of manners in which they're made and applied. But in most homes, these are painted. And as long as they remain painted and uh, undisturbed, uh, they'll be fine. But we've had certain circumstances where homeowners wanted to take these things off themselves. These are very hard and very brittle, and you're going to make quite a friable mess if you try to take these things off. They can be removed, but quite frankly, you can leave them in place. And as long as they're in good shape, we don't disturb them. We keep them painted. It would be uh, at low risk. These can also be found on roofing as well. And unfortunately, what we find in industrial applications of this, it is not painted. These things weather badly and can put asbestos in soil but it's probably not as likely around homes, but it certainly is more of a bigger aspect when it comes to industrial and commercial applications. Uh, boilers that we have in older homes, in the older parts of the country, we could still have uh, steam type boilers. Uh, this is not uncommon with people with heating oil systems or old steam boiler type systems. Um, what you see in the far left is a boiler that is not covered. That's literally the asbestos material that's exposed. 
Um, then we see the pipes in the middle. Um, it's sort of like, ugh, they're not in great shape. I would probably not call that in good shape. And the one that you see on the far right is steam pipes where we have missing insulation and things that are uh, falling apart. This requires professional servicing, folks. This isn't the kind of thing you would want to do. Now, what we can do is there is a possibility uh, with the pipes you see in the middle and the one and the boiler at the left, because this is so expensive to remove, they may be able to do a type of process we call enclosure, where they could put what is called lagging cloth over these materials, although that would have a high cost as well, but probably less expensive than removal. The bottom line is don't disturb this stuff. If we have to disturb it, get professional assistance. Then vermiculite, and many of you have heard about vermiculite. This is a mica-like material that was mined in Libby, Montana. It does contain asbestos. We call it Libby amphibole asbestos these days. Very common is attic insulation. Uh, we find it primarily up north, although down here in the south, I'm in Florida. I've lived most of my life in Georgia. We do find it as well. And again, we need to leave this material alone and not disturb it. It can generate quite a bit of airborne asbestos. Uh, what we can do is have professional help come in and maybe put plywood over these surfaces. We certainly wouldn't want to drag Christmas boxes back and forth across these uh, surfaces like this because we could generate asbestos in that way. So get it covered and don't disturb it. And if you don't know it contains asbestos, it's best to assume that it does. So let me do the last few slides here. And risk in homes, we can map presence, but the possibility of airborne asbestos is very low if ACM is in good condition and it is not disturbed. The mere presence does not impose high risk. That doesn't mean zero, but I'm saying not a high risk. ACM not in good condition, have it repaired or removed only by a licensed, experienced contractor. Then, if you suspect you may have ACM, have an experienced licensed asbestos inspector perform a survey to determine if it is present. Don't guess, folks. If you need to know, but try to find a small uh, uh, inspection company. Most uh, web pages, you can find what are called environmental firms and ask if they do inspections on homes. A lot of times your smaller companies uh, handle this at a reasonable fee, but make sure that when they give you a report, you keep those reports. So that way in the future, if we're going to do renovation, we're going to know what is what contains asbestos or not. Okay, Knowing if ACM is present is very important before renovation in a home or demolition work. Now, some states where I'm at in the, the, the south part of Florida, the three Florida counties uh, that we have in the south part of the state actually require surveys for asbestos, even working in homes, but that's not everywhere. Most states actually don't regulate in that way with private homes. With demolition and renovation, know you have material. Here's the thing you need to remember. Most renovation contractors are not certified to determine if ACM is present, nor to handle that ACM. It's a risk to your family and to their workers. So avoid exposures, have ACM removed from affected areas of construction. Many home demolition contractors will not check to see if ACM is present before demolition. Thus flying from a home demo in an urban area and affecting you. Actually, that's been happening quite a bit and we've had quite a bit of advocacy on that. I worked with a woman in Georgia for about a year and she pressed the Georgia Environmental Protection Division to start cracking down on some of this and they actually got additional funding from the EPA to get some help to do that. So as we said with advocacy, um, it's super important. Toby talked about never you know, asking too many questions. You can never ask too many questions. So if we have an issue with demolition and you think there could be asbestos involved, call your state asbestos program. All you have to do is Google that. Almost all states have an asbestos program. Make a phone call and see what they can do for you. Federal asbestos rules are not written to protect people in homes, okay? Some states may be. The regulations we have, EPA and OSHA regulations, are about commerce, business, not private homes. So knowledge is power. So what I have here in yellow, they are not there to help you. And many people believe that these agencies are there to help homeowners, not on the asbestos issue, but lead paint, absolutely, and other things. But asbestos, the rules aren't written that way unless the state has provisions for that. So prevent exposures to you and your family from legacy asbestos. Don't disturb it. Know what you have before renovation. If you have dust from a demolition that is getting into your home and you don't know whether there's asbestos, especially in older neighborhoods now, call the state asbestos program, get someone to come out and look. You don't want to get in the middle of that with a demolition contractor. And again, 
We don't know if modern construction would have it, but as a general rule, the, in homes, the older the building, the higher the risk. Now, for those that might live in rentals, I probably should have had a slide on this. It really is the responsibility of the owner and manager to handle those issues. So again, if they're gonna do renovation in an apartment and you have things like textured ceilings and drywall, they need to determine whether it's there and make sure the contractor actually handles that meeting OSHA requirements. Otherwise you can be exposed as well as their workers, okay? So as a homeowner, be your own advocate, ask the questions. And um, again, Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization, and I work very closely with Brent with EIA, we'll be glad to help you as best we can. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you very much. We will now go to our last speaker for this session. That is Tony Rich. Uh, great points by Brent and Tom. Um, appreciate their knowledge and experience in sharing with the ADO and uh, the viewing audience. Um, I'd like to touch on more of the subject on asbestos inspections um, and materials that we can find there. And I'd like to also thank you, uh, ADAO, for the opportunity to speak today about legacy asbestos. And hello, everyone, on uh, viewing online. Uh, for over a century uh, and a half, the asbestos industry has produced millions of tons of asbestos materials, the vast majority of which is still present as legacy asbestos. As an asbestos inspector, I see firsthand the overwhelming amount of asbestos. Those materials are used in our nation's buildings and infrastructure, which impact countless people on a daily basis in our everyday places. I mean, think about it. For decades, we've practically surrounded ourselves with a known carcinogen that's claimed and continues to claim countless so many lives. In efforts to control the mass of asbestos problems, government agencies have made regulations dealing with certain aspects around asbestos safety and health, such as inspections and removal protocols, uh, training standards, communication of hazards, and others. But this has this been enough truly to manage the constant risks associated with legacy asbestos? Well, knowing where asbestos is located is one of the most import important of the first steps. As an asbestos inspector, nearly all building materials are suspect. I have yet to find a material, a material type that has not had asbestos put in it, on it, or under it in some form. Asbestos may be found in many common building materials. I call them the usual suspects. Tom touched on that, on that. Brent's touched on that. Generally, floor, ceilings, and walls. I walk in, I see materials here, ceiling tile. What's under this floor? What's in the wall? What's on the wall? Common materials. Flooring material, such as floor tile and sheet flooring, can become damaged from issues such as excess moisture, you get a flood in the basement, or just plain old wear and tear. Hire an experienced accredited asbestos inspector first before any renovation or demolition. Use a licensed asbestos abatement contractor to properly remove ACM. Ceiling materials, such as suspended ceiling panels and ceiling tiles, even the glues used to adhere the tiles may contain asbestos. Again, have a proper asbestos inspection before renovation or demolition. In these photos, you see a suspended ceiling with panels, and above that, you have uh, asbestos-containing ceiling tile with asbestos-containing glue. The plaster that that's adhered to contains asbestos. On the right, you see a close-up of the asbestos tile with bundles of amosite asbestos protruding. Uh, what's on or above the ceiling? In this case, there's asbestos containing fireproofing. Is there debris delaminating from that? On the right, you see uh, IT cables um, where IT personnel move the cables along dragging that asbestos containing materials with them. Um, so the friable asbestos fireproofing, building maintenance personnel, IT staff, 
HVAC technicians, plumbers, mechanical contractors, electrical, electricians, fire protection, protection contractors are all often affected by, by these materials. Also keep in mind that building owners are responsible for having an asbestos survey to communicate potential asbestos exposure hazards to building employees, subcontractors, and occupants. A proper asbestos inspection is necessary to fulfill this responsibility. Um, other sealing materials that are suspect that I've found uh, may include textured surfacing, uh, Tom touched on these uh, as well, such as trowel on plasters, spray applied uh, acoustic materials and other textures. On the far right, you see where they installed a suspended sealing system like we have in this room, but they need to attach wires. And to do that, they went through the asbestos, the previous existing asbestos sealing. In wall materials, uh, gypsum wallboard and drywall, which Tom also touched on, um, as well as plaster and other textured coatings may contain asbestos. Um, in the top left, the electricians cut through ACM drywall joint compound, creating exposure risks to themselves and other in the building. You can see where they, they push through uh, the conduit and they cut through right through the joint compound. Uh, vermiculite insulation uh, in attics and also as masonry fill inside walls is a special concern due, its, due to its inherent friability. If this material is encountered, do not disturb. Minimal disturbance of this material can yield high exposure risks as uh, demonstrated in the bottom photo is a, uh, a magnification of 400 uh, times under a microscope just nothing but fibers just from minimal 10 minute uh, disturbance of uh, zonalite. Um, in other cases where uh, electricians were installing can lights in a house and they cut through, cut holes, cores in the ceiling, out pours zonalite. Uh, additionally, um, you find it in masonry walls as fill and on the right side, that kind of proves the point where in this facility, the uh, forklift was being parked and punctured into the wall, outpours sunlight. Uh, on the bottom, there's also, it's used as aggregate in plasters. Uh, asbestos cement, uh, Tom touched on this as well, is uh, in the US known also as transite. Uh, this photo shows a section of pipe uh, that was uh, broken and you see chrysotile and blue chrysotile just replete throughout the, the material. It's typically a hard, dense material, but can deteriorate over time or become damaged, uh, requiring proper, properly trained personnel and handling protocol. Uh, you see photos here that demonstrate pipes being excavated, a large wall of cement sheet corrugated at an industrial facility, another pipe. Um, you see uh, fibers on the surface of weathered asbestos transite sheeting. The fibers are being liberated and eroded out and house uh, cement siding that looks like bricks, but the fibers are also being eroded from that material. In this case, um, they could have painted it, but they, they liked the coloration of that, that tile. So uh, encapsulating wasn't a factor for this homeowner, so they wanted to remove it. Uh, above ceilings, again, fireproofing, uh, very fibrous, fibrous, friable material. Uh, the same types of trades can be impacted by this material. They're installing uh, wire clamps to the material, and it was just all over the, the building. Um, we have mechanical systems with ACM gaskets and valve packings that can also become damaged during typical renovation and maintenance maintenance activities. These are often overlooked during ACM surveys and renovations. They're usually concealed within pipe flanges and valves, but still properly trained personnel and asbestos abatement contractors are often required to remove these friable materials. Um, here we have examples of the rope-like textile packing material. It's usually wound inside the valve around the valve stem these are the tools on the right that most shop uh, maintenance folks use. They're 
flexible metal corkscrew hooks and they just pick apart and tear apart the material. It's just a mess. Um, caulks, putties, window glazing compounds, sealants, adhesives, uh, all be can become degraded and weathered over time, uh, creating another potential source of asbestos exposure risk. Again, have a proper inspection before renovation or demolition that will find these materials, then you know what to do. Uh, thermal system insulations. Uh, photo on the right is in a school. Um, it's on the floor. People just kind of stepped on it, and there you have friable debris um, over time. Uh, these things can fall apart. Water leaks, materials on the floor, exposure hazards. Uh, it's inherently friable and susceptible to damage, which can easily result in higher exposure risks. They're often found on pipes, uh, boilers, furnaces, HVAC ducts, and air handling equipment. Um, use as licensed asbestos contractors for repair or removal of ACM TSI. And I'd like to take a term from one of Brent's previous uh, presentations on uh, homeowners uh, not to use their own uh, work methods and don't do it yourself. It takes all of us together with proper knowledge and safe practices to make a difference to protect ourselves from legacy asbestos. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. I appreciate your talk so very much. Uh, I'm informed that we have time for two questions. So I'll ask first if anyone has a question, Linda. We have uh, time for just two questions, and Dr. Monforton has one, and I have one from another uh, viewer, and I want to make sure we leave the viewers with resources. So, Brent, could you quickly answer the question? It's a very complicated one from Texas about um, architects, and I also want to make sure that people know that we have a full-on website for legacy and prevention called No K N O W Asbestos. Uh, org, and we're, you're able to get information real time and it links back to government agencies. Thanks, Linda. So uh, 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 an attendee wrote earlier in the week and uh, posed this question and said, uh, uh, the individual said, I understand you'll be hosting a panel on legacy asbestos. It seems to me that any effort to expand the scope of consideration for this problem must begin with ensuring that an existing EPA inspection requirements are being faithfully adhered to and wondering if this particular issue could be spoken to by one of your guests. Uh, I'll speak to that briefly. Uh, I know that Tom Laventhal and Tony may want to say a couple of words about it, but in short, let's, let's say this. Uh, I would absolutely agree. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, existing regulations regarding inspection prior to any disturbance of suspect material needs to first include a thorough investigation by a licensed inspector. Uh, I will say this to you that we have learned through our association that the communities are having, that are having the greatest success with this have passed the enforcement of that down to the local level. And that means when you go to apply for a building permit or a demolition permit, uh, those individuals uh, at the city or county office are saying, hey, show me your asbestos inspection before I'm going to issue a permit. Show me there's no asbestos in there that's going to be disturbed while you're doing this work. Uh, um, you know, unfortunately, EPA does not have a great record of enforcement of these regulations, but when it gets pushed down to the local level, we see that uh, things happen and happen quite well. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Celeste? This question concerns, you know, thinking about climate change and extreme weather events and trying to have a picture, in the, at least here in the U.S., of where, what communities need to be most concerned about all of the different photos you were showing. I mean, my head was just exploding thinking about all the different types of building products that was used. So, you know, is there a particular age of a home where a community would think, you know, we don't really need to worry because our homes were built in the 1990s or is it a 2000 cutoff? You know, if we were to draw a map like of the US and say, you know, these are the places you really need to worry about, or conversely, you know, these neighborhoods weren't developed until 2000. You know, what advice do you provide? Because it really is scary when you see all of those different 
possible exposures, but you're looking at your own house and you don't really know, and it's a newer house. I'm happy to take that one. Uh, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to put a cautionary note on it. And I'm going to remind you, asbestos still has not been banned in this country. But largely, I would say to you, anything that is 1980 or prior has a very high likelihood of some uh, significant quantities of asbestos containing materials. After that time, I think it starts to drop downhill rather dramatically. Uh, and we're left with probably more non-friable materials, even through the 80s. And then as we get to the 90s, I think you're going to see even less. Uh, so any communities that are 1980 or older, I would say, yeah, I have a concern about uh, storm damage, water damage, floods, hurricanes. Yes.